Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we are going to explore the question of what is a UFO? My guest is Greg Bishop. He is the author of a number of books about ufology, including Project Beta, a book that looks at the national security implications and the development of the modern UFO mythology. It defies language, a collection of his personal essays probing the meaning of UFO phenomenology and co-authored a is for Adamski, an encyclopedic book about UFO contactees. Greg is here with me in the studio in Albuquerque. Welcome, Greg. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you once again live yeah. in our studio in Albuquerque. I appreciate that you came to Albuquerque from the Los Angeles area. I love Albuquerque in New Mexico, and I'm just lucky that you're here, you know, <laughs> and has moved here and we get to meet here because I, I like coming anyway. Well, Albuquerque in particular and New Mexico in general seems to be a hot spot for UFO activity. It is. It has been since the beginning, New Mexico, actually. I mean, one of the first mysteries, U.S. based mysteries having to do with UFOs or the skies or unidentified objects was the green fireball phenomenon in the 1940s. And uh, was very interesting to the government because they didn't know what was going on. They said, like, what are these green things coming out of the sky? Are they, are they Russian? What are they? And so there was a, a lot of uh, attention paid to and research done on them at the time. Do you know, were any conclusions drawn? The conclusion was it's not Russian and it's not a, it's not a threat. <laughs> and I think the guy that, uh, the scientist that was assigned to write about it was named Lincoln La Paz. Uh, and uh, he wrote a paper about it, and his conclusion was, don't know what it is, but it's not a threat to national security, and it's not Russian. So as long as they knew that, they just dropped it, as far as I know. Well, New Mexico is also a state associated with the development of uh, atomic weapons. Yes. And uh, there's also been a history of UFO activity associated with various nuclear weapons, uh, launch sites and mm -hmm. facilities. You can look at that in a couple, a few different ways, but the two that I can think of is one, something that's non-human is, is interested in our, our uh, continuing uh, interest in destroying ourselves, <laughs> and two, the that interest in destroying ourselves is so basic to who we are and so basic to our understanding of ourselves and our future that Anything that did want to pay any attention to us, either inwardly, endemic to this planet, uh, in another dimension, whatever you want to call it, would be attracted to places like that because they are so pregnant with, with, um, with uh, tragic possibility. So, um, yeah, in, in, in any case, it's, it's psycho psychically, psychologically, and practically interesting to anything that wouldn't be human. Or something that is um, that reflects our collective uh, um, uh, anxieties about such things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, it seems to me obvious that uh, that uh, weird stuff happens around places that are, you know, it's just like hauntings or something like that. There's there's a, a very heavy emotional component uh, associated with place, and that uh, seems to um, uh, engender. Uh, phenomena to happen, or at least people to experience it. Well, it seems as if we're at a unique time in history where, for the, really the first time in my generation, the human race has the capability, potentially, mm -hmm. of destroying ourselves yeah. completely. The extinction of an entire sentient species yeah. is, is a possibility. <laughs> and as a result of that possibility, it, it would seem as if the the psyche must be activated in ways that we can hardly imagine that might have something to do with the phenomenology of UFOs. It, 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 it could form or allow to form something physical or apparently physical out of a psychological 
uh, uneasiness or need or whatever. I mean, it, it has a very strong uh, emotional component. And when you start looking at anything associated with the psychic world or paranormal phenomena, it seems to center around anxiety and heavy emotion. It just seems like it's a magnet. It's, a, it's an attractor to these kind of phenomena. And um, things that have an emotional component seem to have more of a, you know, it, if you want repeatability in parapsychology, if you apply emotion to it or some kind of emotional component, it seems to help. Zener cards, very, very, very quick, uh, you know far more about this than me, but very quick uh, drop off because it's boring. Mm -hmm. But then somebody like uh, Dean Radin will come along and do a presentiment experiment that has images in it that are very emotionally laden. And those seem to, you know, push the signal uh, beyond a, a linear time. And uh, I think some of this may be involved with uh, UFO sightings, encounters, all that. And it's interesting how they became much more prevalent after World War II and after the introduction of the uh, nu nuclear weapons. So it's, you know, it, we could talk all day about uh, the collective unconscious and how that, that uh, fits into the uh, UFO subject. But um, uh, to me, it's uh, what, what is forgotten a lot of the times uh, when people are studying UFOs is that they look technological. So we assume that they're a technology. But I can't think of any technology that could change somebody's life in 10 minutes. If you were an artist and you could change somebody's life in 10 minutes permanently, you'd be the most famous artist that ever lived. And so that's what's interesting to me about the UFO subject right now is that how it affects our emotional lives and our, our, our psychological selves and our sense of self and our, our um, uh, sense individually of who we are and also collectively. Mm -hmm. But I'm really interested in the individual right now because it, that's, who, that's where it comes from. I mean, people see things and they talk about them, you know, and, uh, and I don't think we're asking the right questions right now. Of course, an awful lot of the UFO research is based on the reports of people who have witnessed something. Yeah. Uh, but we also have photographs, yes. radar traces, and yeah. other forms of hard evidence. You know what's interesting? We do. And it manifests physically in those ways, in the ways we expect. But what I've realized uh, fairly recently is if there is an image captured, I think that that image becomes what the, what the experience is subservient to. You lose the richness of that, that experience because all you're trying to do is prove that's what I saw that, on that picture. And many times we've seen uh, cases where people see different things, completely different things, experience completely different things. Or even in some cases, photograph something that wasn't there, or they photograph something that was there, but other people say that's not what it looked like. So in the UFO realm, um, reality as we know it becomes kind of malleable. Mm. And if it's malleable like that, I mean, uh, what is our truth there? And I'm not sure what it is, but I'm sure that the human mind and nervous system and visual system and psychology, all of those things are an important instrument to try and figure out what causes these reports. But if we get caught up in it, you know, in its analogy to an instrument, I think we lose a lot of the richness of the experience that could come out just by asking, what did your eyes see? What did your ears hear? How fast did something move? Uh, I think the more important questions to ask a UFO witness is, um, what happened right before? Is there something that happened in your life before this that seems to be, be you know, important to you, or important to this experience? What happened afterwards? How did your life change? You know, how did it make you feel? Uh, UFO investigators don't ask these questions. They just want hard data about what somebody saw that can be put in a database. And yes, you know, emotional reactions can be put in a database as well. I mean, if you're a psychologist, of course you know that. But that hasn't been cataloged really. And I think if we start looking at that side of the equation, the right brain side of the equation, that um, uh, uh, aspects of this will be revealed, which may give us a little bit more insight as to what causes these things. Well, I know you've had some interaction with Native American cultures. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm aware that they seem to have a different relationship to right. the UFO phenomena. It seems like it's integrated into their culture, that this is something that they they see as part of the natural world that they've interacted with for a long time. Yeah, um, it's, you know, I don't know how much of this is to please visitors, but, um, you know, visitors from outside the culture, but what I, what's been described to me is exactly what you've said. And that anything we call anomalous is just part of what is. You see something and that's the thing you saw. And how does it fit into our culture? Well, well our culture, culture says, let's see. In one instance, this guy told me, well, what we're seeing is um, the people that originally were us. They're just coming to say hi. They're, they're, he said they're, you know, they call them star people just because that's the, that's the image that they can use in their language to describe it. Um, but I think to their mind, it's not star people coming from wherever, wherever. They're always with them in some way. And it's just a part of the natural world and a part of interaction with things that aren't them, that are sentient. Just as they think a rock or a, or a bear or a deer or whatever or a plant is also sentient and also part of, part of the world. And it's, it's, it's all integrated into one. Whereas in the Western mind, we, we bifurcate things and we put things in categories. And in that way, we kind of lose some of these um, uh, relationships that might be able to give us a richer idea of what's behind them. I mean, it, it, if you think about anybody that has some kind of a, um, a uh, uh, revelatory experience, or even if you just, uh, you're a heavy meditator, you get to the point where you realize you and the rock and everything else are the same thing. And if you, you know, if you want to put the uh, UFO um, story into that, you become, you know, you, it becomes something that's just natural and there and, and, and should be there. You just have to understand in a way that makes sense to you. And the Native American cultures do that with everything. In fact, most indigenous cultures around the world, as far as I know, um, they don't, they don't put things into a paranormal category. They just put it into a category that doesn't happen all the time, you know, and that it, uh, since it comes from a realm that you don't see every day, it might have some truth to it that you don't realize if you just stay in the physical and in the, you know, I've got to get food today and, you know, uh, where, where did my kid go or whatever. Um, the, these things are just important, probably more important because they're not things you deal with every day. Um, and I think if we looked at the UFO that way and a little bit more of that uh, inclusive uh, attitude, that some truths from those things, uh, from, from that subject, from UFOs, from whatever we call UFOs might be revealed. And I think it'll be on an individual basis, which is another thing. It's just, I don't think you can put it in a box and say, this is what it is. Because everybody that comes to it is going to bring their, as we said before, like Timothy Leary, set and setting to that experience and to their interpretation of it. But realize that they're all basically looking at the same thing through different lenses. Um, because we don't have a cultural basket for it now. Our cultural basket now is aliens coming from other planets. And um, it's going to remain stuck there until there's some sort of um, change in, or revolution in thinking. The only other thing I can think of that can have where your life can be changed in a few minutes like that is either um, uh, a Satori moment or a woman, a woman of enlightenment or um, through psychedelic uh, mm. drugs. You know, in, in you know, DMT, it probably happened in 10 minutes. But, you know, I've, I know many people have had their basic outlooks changed through one experience with a psychedelic. And... The fact that that's a close analogy to what's going on with the UFO is interesting to me. And also, and I, you may have interviewed and talked to um, uh, who wrote DMT, the spirit molecule? Rick Strassman, Strassman I yeah. have. Yes, he sat right in that chair. Yeah. He, um, when that book first came out in the mid-90s, I think it was, I thought it was fascinating that he said people started reporting entities talking to them. And he said, I did not plan it. I did not ask for it. And it actually made me quite nervous. But I couldn't deny it. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that it had a lot of analogies to the abduction scenario was really interesting to me. And not, and you know, people first, you, you hear that, it's like, well, people are on drugs. Of course, they're going to think that. It's no. If somebody's on a drug, it's not, especially a psychotropic drug like that. It's not going to affect everybody the same way. Yet he found this analogy and these commonalities across 
many different uh, 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 subjects and many different trials. And that to me was fascinating. I thought it had a, had a lot to say to the UFO community who did not listen. They, they, didn't, they wanted, didn't want to hear it because it's drugs and it's disreputable. And as, a, you know, as if the UFO subject isn't disreputable enough. Well, that's the thing about a disreputable uh, community. They don't want to associate with other disreputable communities. Yeah. It's, it's like they got enough trouble with their own. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's just this guilt by association. They just they look for respectability. Yeah. which I think is a really big mistake. <laughs> if you're involved in something that's so-called disreputable, trying to make it reputable makes you look even sillier, I think. How do you see the analogy with the psychedelic drug being meaningful? What, what could you read into it? What can, where can you go with that? Uh, well, the first thing I can think of is what I said before is there is a point in many uh, people's psychedelic experiences where they have a realization that um, that boundaries disappear, mm -hmm. that, and if you take a powerful enough dose, you disappear. Yeah. Your ego becomes subsumed into the greater reality. Mm -hmm. And if that's the way you thought all the, if you were the Dalai Lama and those, those boundaries, I don't know how the Dalai Lama thinks, but as an example, those boundaries didn't exist. I think your understanding of a paranormal experience or a UFO experience would be far richer. It would be easier to accept. It would keep you from becoming um, um, ostracized inwardly and outwardly from your, from your society and your friends and all that. And that you could accept it as something that was normal and natural rather than something that was uh, um, uh, strange and off the beaten track and outside the pale or whatever, it, uh, it, that, that sense of oneness would, would um, pervade your, your outlook. And if that's the case, almost nothing can harm you, really. The very word psychedelic means mind manifesting. The idea, some people have said taking psychedelics is like having a microscope into your own consciousness. Mm -hmm. it, it's manifesting the depths within you and to some extent externalizing them. And people have suggested that maybe uh, what we think of as UFOs is some kind of a projection from within our ourselves, a, a, even a psychokinetic projection of the, mm -hmm. the depths of the mind. When I did this research with Ted Owens, he yeah. called himself the PK man, right. standing for psychokinesis. And there was always this mystery. Is he creating the UFO phenomenon that would appear when he said they would? Or is he predicting it? Mm -hmm. Is it he in telepathic communication with aliens, as he sometimes suggested? There was always always this ambiguity. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about that, maybe he had the ability to unstick himself in time and from linear time and know when something might happen, even though it hadn't happened yet, because to him, it's just all happened at the same time. And as he got closer to it, something that had a, had a personal meaning to him would be able to be manifested as either a sense or if you, if you would, and as you suggested, something that was, um, you know, almost apported there, uh, psycho, psych, psychokinetically created. Um, for a, a normal, like, uh, UFO witness, I think they just stumble onto things and it changed, it, uh, I, I, I don't think that they've created it, but I think that they are co-creating it as it happens. And that may even run into the physical. Um, not just co-creating the memory and the images and all that, but the actual physical, like if you put an instrument there, yeah. that it would measure something. It might not measure what they saw or think they saw, but it would measure something. I'm reminded of the great film I saw, I think in about 1954, yeah. Forbidden Planet. Yes. Where they, um, they're on another planet, uh, which has an extinct civilization, but their technology. The Krell, yeah. The Krell's technology has survived a 
an American scientist is on the planet. He learns how to use the technology. Uh, the group of people there uh, in his compound are being besieged by some sort of strange monster. And later, it's revealed that the monster is a product of the id yeah. of this scientist who is working with the Krell technology. And he can, you know, the monsters of the unconscious can become yeah. manifest. Yeah. He calls it the monster from of the id or from the id. Yeah. And it's all, as, as far as I remember it, um, besides being a, an analog for the Tempest, the, 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 the uh, Shakespeare play, right? It was a Tempest. Um, yeah, the beautiful daughter who falls in love with the sailor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, that the, the technology allowed, oh, that's what it was. Everything that he was frustrated about and all his fears and all that became manifest by that, whatever that psychotronic technology they had that allowed them to, you know. He was a jealous father. He didn't yeah. want his daughter to run off with this uh, yeah. uh, UFO pilot, an American, of yeah. course. Yeah. And, and and so his Very Freudian, subconscious <laughs> was, yeah, uh, manifesting materially. Yes. And that may be something that happens normally in in our world, and that uh, sci you know, cause a lot of science fiction does speculate in areas that can help us um, speculate about reality and speculate about um, things that are on the edge of our understanding. And I I think in that case it was uh, the idea that something could manifest physically that was only mental was kind of ahead of its time in a lot of ways. Um, and I don't think that I can't remember who wrote it, but whoever wrote the screenplay, I kind of think they didn't know anything about parapsychology or about uh, apported objects or anything like that. But they were able to pick up on that theme through, you know, uh, that has run through literature for you know, since people have been writing things. Well, it's certainly since the 19th century, mm -hmm. there is an extensive literature on what used to be called, for example, the physical phenomena of mysticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that, you know, mediums can manifest ectoplasm and uh, levitations and spirit materializations, yeah. uh, things like that. Well, if that's a uh, potentiality within the human species, could it also be involved in the UFO phenomena. Why not? Yeah, well, of course. It's, it, it, it would explain a lot of parts of what happens in UFO encounters. The funny thing is, if once you get an explanation for something with the UFO uh, phenomenon, if you stick with that explanation, you will find very quickly there are a lot of people that find a lot of problems with that one idea because it doesn't account for everything. Mm -hmm. It accounts for a great deal of it, but not everything. So my idea about the, uh, you know, about researching UFOs is to consider everything with almost no filters to see if I can syncretize some kind of theory or idea about what these might be coming from, where they might be coming from, how they affect people, how it manifests for the individual, for, uh, for somebody that hears the story, for the society in general. And right now, I think a lot of that stuff is being, one, reinforced as, as a reality, but two, and I hope this is true, it is allowing people to think about it without having to be embarrassed about it or having to hide it. And anytime that happens, when you get a variety of things, it's like throwing 500 seeds out, you know, uh, maybe three of them will sprout, but they might be seeds and sprouts and plants you've never seen before that add to our understanding. And I don't know what those are yet. Um, but talking about this stuff and theorizing about it, especially with something as ephemeral as, as the UFO thing, it could almost manifest as what you think it is. Mm -hmm. And if you're worried about the dichotomy between is it real and is it not, I think you're already behind. Um, as long as the mind can perceive it, deal with it, um, and also share it and integrate it, then it is real for that person. And if it's real for that person and it's not causing them problems, then to me something's real, you know, um, and I want to know about it. I don't have to accept whether it's real for me or not. What I want to know is why you think this, what happened to you, why you believe this, how did it change you? And in the midst, I had a question somewhere on, on an a, a interview show. Um, they were talking about UFOs, and I, I mentioned this stuff that we've just been talking about. 
And the host said, or no, one of the other guests said, well, where does that leave us? I mean, that's, there's nothing we can get out of that. There's no hard evidence or data there. And I said, he said, um, what do you, where do you think that'll lead us? And I said, I don't know. He said, what use is it? And I said, the only use I can see of it is let's try some new tools and some new techniques and see what comes out of it. Just experiment with these ideas, experiment with um, um, treating witnesses and, and, and uh, abductees and all that in a, in a different way that honors their experience and their perceptions and see what happens from that. You might not be able to stick it in the database, but I bet you would get a, better, a deeper understanding of what's going on. And you don't even know what it—you won't even know what it is until you've been talking to enough people. But you have to be patient and have faith that you know eventually that'll happen. And if not, at least you'd, you've helped some people, right? So. <laughs> well, I know you focused to some extent on the work of the psychologist Donald Hoffman, very popular lately, and the main point he's making is we think that we are aware of the external world because we sense it. We yeah. hear, we see, we mm -hmm. touch, we smell, we taste, but all of our sensory organs uh, provide us with a tiny little sliver yeah. of uh, what's out there, really. So, for the most part, we're unaware of the world around us. Yeah, his idea is that um, our senses are geared to having us survive, um, reproduce, eat, protect ourselves, protect our offspring, all those things. And anything outside that realm, our senses don't detect them because we don't need to. And if you want to be Darwinian about it, as you'd mentioned earlier, um, it's that keeps us, and this is Donald Hoffman's idea, that keeps us from seeing a total reality. The subtitle of his book um, is How We Create What We See. Um, and he's even, you know, uh, you know what, are our, what are our instruments, our cameras and all? They're extensions of our senses. Mm -hmm. So they're going to show us what we expect to see. Um, and his analogy that I use when I've, I've done lectures is that um, if you are a hungry lion looking to mate, you won't care. I mean, I'm sorry. If you're a, a lion looking to mate and you stick a steak in front of you, you might the lion might not even see the steak because it is not interested in that right now. Um, and so that that steak does not exist for that lion. Um, and so you know the analogy is if it's, there's something that appears to you that doesn't it doesn't concern your survival or you know immediate danger or anything like that, you don't see it. But if you do see it, that's what you're concerned about. What is it? Is it going to kill me? Do I have to run away from it? That's your concern. Not what color it is, where does it come from, all that stuff. That that comes later in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. um, and in between that first sensory input and your telling, just remembering it a few milliseconds later, there is a vast amount of, of uh, interpretation going on there in your subconscious before it even reaches your conscious awareness. I think um, Joe McMonigle, the remote viewer, wrote about this, about how conscious awareness is basically a split second behind what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. By the time it hits your conscious awareness, whatever it was that's happening is not happening anymore and may have no relationship to what that is. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about UFOs, something appears, you see it. And by the time you realize what's going on, your mind is, and your, 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 your uh, subconscious mind and your survival instinct has already decided what it is, no matter what it is before that. And so if you look at the, uh, the human being as a, you know, as a recording instrument that records things dispassionately, that is, um, which is the model most people use, especially UFO researchers, then you're, you're doing the, the, the human instrument a disservice. And so my idea is, why don't we take a look at the foibles or whatever, the, the, not even the foibles, but the uh, nature of this instrument and how it, quote unquote, records what's going on. Because if we can figure out how the mind re you know, remembers, how the visual system sees, how um, we see colors, how we see patterns, how, you know, what, what, what pleases us, what doesn't. If we can strip away that stuff or at least figure out what it's doing before the message gets to our conscious mind and our recall, we might be able to get sort of towards an idea of what that um, uh, uh, precipitating event might be. And that's very interesting to me. And there may be no way to do that. And we're, all we're left with is, is language and metaphors and all that. 
But if we're aware that we're left with language and metaphors and all that, maybe we can kind of worm our way towards a, at least some sort of second or third level understanding of what we're dealing with, rather than saying it's aliens coming from other planets, which it may very well be. But to me, that's the least interesting of the explanations. It just locks us into one one understanding. And I, I it just for myself, my my the way I think, I don't like being prisoner to one type, type of understanding. Well, you have emphasized the idea that we should look at the individual person and how an encounter with this mysterious reality is impacting the person. Mm -hmm. I wonder if another way to look at it might be to, to look at the human species as a whole. And uh, I'm thinking now of something that Ingo Swan uh, a great remote viewer, a great psychic who, who explored UFO phenomenology. Mm -hmm. He looked at the human race at one time and he said, you know, we have incredible psychic potentials. We could become a very psychic species. And, and all the development that Ingo kind of initiated 50 years ago in the field of remote viewing is yeah. coming to fruition. You see that now more and more people are understanding. I never thought I could do this, but I can. Yeah. And, and so Ingo was thinking, could it be that some sort of an external force associated with UFOs is trying to suppress the innate potentials of the human species. Yeah, I do remember he said that. Um, I hesitate to assign that sort of teleology to the phenomenon, mm -hmm. but it is a distinct possibility, especially if you um, use the analogy of what you know human survival is like. I don't know if you're dealing with an intelligence that is not us that you can assign our same motivations to it. Um, but at a certain point, our motivations become whatever the motivations of that thing is because there's no other way we can look at it. I mean, if we can't describe something in language, we can't just, we, we, it just doesn't exist. And, and then there's the issue of why would we think that the UFOs are alien, not yeah. part of us? Some people say, well, they're us from the future, or they yeah. are. Michael Masters says that. A yeah. projection of our subconscious mind, mm -hmm. the idea that we discussed the forbidden planet metaphor. Yeah. Uh, they may very well just be other versions of ourselves. You know, part of my co-creation idea is everything we put on this, on this phenomena comes from us. Mm -hmm. Phenomenon comes from us. And we have to look at it in that way. Um, I also wrote an essay, I think it's actually in um, It Defies Language, where I said, well, what if the UFO phenomenon is like wind and waves and and anything natural that's happening and we just put our own meaning on it? The winds and the waves are going to do what they want. They're just going to do what they do. But if you happen to be around wind and waves, what do you think as a human? I want to get somewhere. Well, I'm going to use the waves as something to float on and the wind as something to push me along. Mm -hmm. And to us, that's the meaning of the wind and waves. But to the wind and waves, it, they ju they're just doing what they do. So, you know, maybe we're pulling meaning out of something mm -hmm. that to us has no logical meaning. Um, and we might have to look at it in that way. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is if I'd been abducted and had my own experience, which I don't think I have, I may have a totally different idea. I might say there's aliens here. They want us to do this. And I turn into a contactee. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I think about it. I'd like to be able to think that I could keep my, 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 my illusion of, uh, of, of uh, objectivity, but I don't know if I could. There's so many different ways to look at it. Yeah. I, I know it would, might seem, for example, we're here in my studio, just the two of us. But for all we know, th this room with its black walls is populated by all sorts of other invisible beings yeah. who, who might choose to manifest themselves one way or another. Yeah, it, it could be. And it's just it takes a change in the environment or something locally that's going on or our emotions or what we're talking about or, you know, if I was upset earlier today for any of that stuff to manifest. You did ask me um, earlier uh, after my wife passed away if I'd uh, experienced anything and I said no. I did experience two things. One was I thought I saw three bushes going, shadows of bushes going across my wall. 
as if somebody was holding little shadows of round manicured bushes on a pe- on a stick, just sh- uh, 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 silhouettes and moving it across. The oh, I see. And I saw it with my glasses off, so it wasn't clear, but it was definitely three shadows. Mm-hmm. And there was no other light source in the room. It wasn't being sh- there wasn't a shadow from a light light source that was anywhere that could have caused those shadows. It was way off to the side, and I just kind of went. I don't know what that means, Jeff. I really don't. But that happened about a month after she passed away. Mm-hmm. And then recently, we were talking about Whitley and his um, uh, white moth, mm-hmm. uh, and Anne and his wife Anne. Yes. Strange you asked me the question. I said, no, not any, not really. And I had to think about it for a second. And this happens to UFO witnesses too. They forget that something has happened until somebody says something offhand years later and then bang, it it unlocks that memory. And the thing that unlocked for me, I don't even know if this is relevant, but I wanted to say Mm -hmm. it. In the last two weeks, for a period of about three days, I had little tiny white moths about that big that would just fly around my face and not leave me alone. And then I was outside and I saw a very large white moth. And then after that, the little one stopped flying around my face. Now, our viewers may not appreciate that for Whitley Strieber, the white moth is a symbol of the soul. It comes from a poem by Yeats, in fact, that Whitley recited in one of my interviews with him. Yes. Yeah, and he, he says that him and uh, his wife, Anne, um, that was her favorite poem, and that they agreed that if the, there was a sign to come back, it would be as a white moth. Is, is that correct? Yes, as I recall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the, the thing is, I know Whitley fairly well, and that um, maybe I had a contact, you know, contact paranormal experience off of him by having that happen. But it was just so weird, because I just kept going, why are these white moths flying around my face? And they... Like I said, it was only for three days, and then it stopped. Well, since you brought up Whitley, and we've now talked about your wife's death, Mm -hmm. which I'm sorry to learn about. I know it was only two years ago. It brings up the whole question of the relationship between the paranormal, the afterlife, and UFO phenomenology. That door was opened for me when Whitley said... Um, one time he and Anne were um, talking about the visitors and she said, uh, the, the, this phenomenon seems to have some connection, very deep connection to the dead. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, uh, my friend Josh has just written a book about death and UFO phenomena. You might want to have him on. Yes, it's a phenomenon or, or an intersection of two areas of research I'm greatly interested mm-hmm. in. Yeah, And he might be able to describe it better. In fact, I know he would because he's just written an entire book on it. Mm-hmm. But um, whatever realm that you think death leads to or comes from um, has a seems to have an analogy to whatever realm you think uh, a extra human consciousness might come from. The great unknown. Yeah. Whatever that other dimension is, or the dimension beside us, or the reality beside us, or the unseen one, or whatever you want to call it, that may be accessed through, generally through death, but maybe other things like um, psychedelic drugs, or meditation, or any mind-altering thing. Um or a spontaneous thing like a UFO uh, uh, abduction or, or a sighting or something like that. Yeah. Um, the analogy there is there's something else that we don't see all the time. And that if we could understand what that realm was or how to get to it or come back from it or its relationship to us, then we might understand a little bit more about um, where where str- some of these strange phenomena come from and where they live. I mean, they... they, they uh, my idea a long time ago, uh, as I was looking at this, is that that if there are extra human entities, they probably inhabit a realm that does not worry about time, linear time, or even space as we know it. But they can experience it if they want. And Whitley's idea is actually that these that his visitors are experiencing um, our uncertainty of life through their interaction mm-hmm. with us. And that's a really interesting idea because um, he said at the, they know everything that's going to happen and it has happened. And they, they miss being surprised 
<laughs> so that's that's why they that's why they need us because of that element of surprise. I mean, it even goes back to the idea of of, of God creating reality because he wanted to know what it was like. He whatever it is wanted to know what not being God was like. Yeah. To, to have that dichotomy to work with. All of the trillions of experiences not being God can be like. Yeah. And so, you know, Whitley has that idea about the visitors and that they, they need us very intimately to do those kind of things. And the only way they can access it is through people like him or other abductees uh, or, or if somebody dies like Anne. So, um, and a lot of this seems to be built on feelings and intuition and things like that, which is why I, you know, I'm very interested to ask people that have had UFO experiences, do you have a change in your, you know, intuition or um, feelings about things or, uh, you know, do you, do you feel time is different for you now or whatever? Just how have you been changed? Uh, psychologically, never mind physically, like uh, people like Kit Green and Gary Gary Nolan are working on. Mm -hmm. But how has it changed you? How has it changed your inner life? Um, because if it changes your inner life, there's something very significant going on there that can't be put in a database, right. um, or can't be you can't you know express it in rows of numbers. A lot of people think the UFO thing can be solved with rows of numbers, and I really don't think so. No, it's a question of, uh, as you're expressing it, meaning. Yeah, meaning. I, uh, the first time I interviewed Dean Radin, he said, uh, what I'm thinking I'm finding out is meaning is a dimension. He forgot he said that. I told him that years later and he mm. said, I said that? That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, we could continue this conversation uh, probably forever because yes. uh, the UFOs are related to a mystery and I, I don't think the human race will ever be free of mystery. No, it won't because it, it, I think when something happens, when we figure something out, um, Whatever it is that is is our destiny just jumps ahead <laughs> and sort of leads us more into the, it just keeps going like this. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. You don't know everything. Yeah. And to me, that's the fascinating part of it. Uh, people say they want to solve the UFO subject. I don't want to solve anything. I want to understand something better. I want to understand the, the, the subject better. I want to understand how it changes people and how I relate to it. That's... That will be satisfaction and an answer for me, not what are UFOs. I think that's a that's a meaningless question, and it's 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 you know it's it's uh it's Sisyphean. It, it it will never end. You just keep pushing that rock up the hill; it's going to roll back. But if why don't you just be Zen and forget about the damn rock? <laughs> Well, Greg Bishop, what a pleasurable conversation. I'm so glad that you came to Albuquerque and uh, we've had these three interviews now. Uh, it's been a great joy. Thank you for being with me. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been, it's been it, it just incredibly fun. It's so fun to talk about these subjects. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.